Yeah, sorry about that long introduction music. I was uh, talking with uh, Rick St. Germain as he came in the studio here. We're getting things uh, organized. In fact, I still got papers all over the place. Uh, Rick, you got to help keep me organized here. Uh, joining me in the studio today is uh, Rick St. Germain, uh, kind of, um, I don't know, the label is kind of the LCL historian. Do you accept that label? Yeah, I've been doing that <laughs> for quite a few years. So um, a big the, the anniversary is happening this year, um, the 100th anniversary of the flooding of Coast, and I know there's a lot of uh, Coast surviving family members um, that are looking at putting together a, a, a remembrance, a commemoration event uh, coming up on August 12th. But there's some other events uh, happening in front of that. And let's start with um, really what happened. And let's educate our listeners, both Native and non-Native, who listen to this station about what happened 100 years ago uh, this year. So, Mark. We're um, honoring the 100th, the 100th anniversary of the flooding and the destruction of Pukwewang. Uh, it was a major village, a bustling village, just filled with all the signature items of the modern society. Yeah. 100 years ago, back in uh, the early 1900s. It was a bustling place. It had churches, it had stores, it had cool. trading post school, yeah. it had a jail. I mean, it had just tons of activity. It was a stopping place, a major stopping place, mm. both via the river and also a roadway that connected yeah. it between uh, Hayward and, and uh, Winter. You know, uh, I talked to several people who actually rode wagons and uh, on journeys from Hayward to Winter and back in around the turn of the century it was a bustling uh, economy over there with logs rolling down the yeah. river and and uh, grain and seed and just seed and, and tons of things that were being transported back and forth. So the Quaylong was also known as the Pope and it was a place where there was uh, lots of uh, Native Americans people, most of whom spoke Ojibwe, but occasionally uh, the, the people who were uh, moving on through with supplies would stop there and they'd sit around near some real tall red pine trees uh, close to the midday ground and, um, and they would, uh, you know, talk about developments that were happening either up in mm. Lake Superior or further south down along. River perhaps, yeah. So it was a, a pretty exciting place, and all this got destroyed a hundred years ago. And so, uh, and they, the, the government um, conspired with um, a number of corporate interests, and um, you know, some of our congressmen went in cahoots. Yeah. The BIA, who was supposed to protect us, was really feeding us to the, to the wolves. And we lost. We fought against it. Soon there was major legislation that condemned over 5,000 acres of our mm. property and just destroyed our reservation. Not only did it inundate that major bustling small town uh, village of Pequewan, uh, but also over at Chief Lake and, and places to the east. We had scattered homes located all around the riverway, which yeah. uh, were inundated. Yeah. And it was tragic. It now, was you're just, saying there was uh, collaboration from a lot of these corporate people a couple of years before any of these discussions really started to happen. Well, it was more like 20-some years. 20-some years. Before, okay. Yeah. And it, wow. it was a lengthy process. There were hearings that were required to be held uh, by the federal government. And, uh, and and the Congress yeah. that required these hearings to be held with the tribal members. After all, what they were doing was violating uh, Article 13 and and uh, also uh, the 
preamble of the Treaty of 1854. It was mm. sacred. It was a legal document. It was a foolproof contract between the Lakota tribe and uh, the federal government. And it was the federal government that went and violated that treaty. They, mm. you know, uh, created this contract between the tribes. No. And guaranteed those tribes their reservation lands and promised never to bother the reservation property. It, it's really a sad, uh, major benchmark in the history of our tribe. And I, I look back now, uh, you know, 52 years ago, uh, a, a handful of tribal members fought hard and uh, Eddie Benton and Mike Seymour, I could name a host of folks we, we would meet on a regular basis and, and try to get something done about the uh, uh, effort of NSP at that time yeah. to uh, relicense the lease on uh, flooding the Chippewa Flowers. Well, these are some things that we're looking back on in time you know, we look back 50-some years. We look back 100 years when people were actually driven out of their homes. Right, yeah. So I remember 52 years ago, we fought hard, and we were just looking back 50 years and saying, right. uh, you know, all these horrible things happened to our people, and they got driven all over the place. Mm -hmm. And those folks didn't have a prayer. You know, they were battling against Forces, corporate, multi-state corporate. Sure. Service. Yeah. And you know our people spoke of Ojibwe. They didn't know anything about the legal. There's yeah. many things that I want to talk about today. I want to also talk about Mark that um, we are having these events, uh, big events on the reservation here up at Nipco on July 21st. Now, that's uh, about five days after the conclusion of Honor the Earth. Okay. And also, at the Honor the Earth yeah. powwow, right. we're also having a, uh, we're going to hold the powwow up and talk about those tragic events that occurred. And we're going to have a event there in which we're going to have educational materials yeah. to inform the uh, powwow attendees that, uh, you know, of the uh, circumstances. Uh, flooding of our, of our reservation. Mm -hmm. Also on August 12th, the descendants of uh, the people that were driven out of their homes um, are going to hold a uh, spiritual uh, commemoration. Sure. And they're going to do that right out on Church Island, and that's the closest we can get okay. to the uh, village that was destroyed. Yeah. This is going to be a very uh, honorable uh, spiritual uh, ceremony that's going to be held there on the island. And they're going to be standing among graves, uh, mm -hmm. the graves that were both dug up and the graves that, that remain there. Yeah. And also, they're going to be standing above the graves that were inundated by the flooding. Right. The yeah. And, you know, it, I, I look back after 52 years and I just say, my God, you know, the descendants are taking hold of this responsibility and they're doing it. They're, they're just mm -hmm. tremendous people. Um, they're not only tremendous people, but they're, they're informed people. They have the history from their ancestors. No. who were driven out, and those include Mark Fair and Tom Painter and Doreen Debro and Dino Shogi and Tim Debro, Deb Valentine, um, Dean Schmack, Elaine Debro, Father Karun, Sister Felissa. Believe it or not, um, Father Karun and Sister Felissa are joining that community. Mm. Every Wednesday night mm. at five thirty, they show up because their St. Anthony Church was destroyed back in mm. nineteen twenty-three, a hundred years ago, 
and it was rebuilt in the new village which yeah. is called yeah. Saint Ignatius. Uh, yeah. I also want to mention that um, the planners who were working on the um, uh, the July twenty first event, which is an educational and informative confab up in the village of Newport by the historic stone building. Mm. Those people include Faith Smith, Carol Path, and Sylvia Brack. So, so we're working yeah. together hand in hand with the descendants. And I should mention, I, I always mention the descendants and then I say, and Faith Smith. But Faith Smith is a descendant. Oh, her, okay. Her people were yeah. driven out in several places. And I just, I want to recognize these descendants because I'm so proud of them. I look back 52 years, and I say, you know, we didn't have this back then. And here we are now, 100 years, and I'm just, I'm just beaming with pride at how these descendants have grabbed this yeah. and are marking the significance of this And are they're the, doing something about it. Yeah. Are the people you mentioned, are they um, second generation descendants? Or are some, yeah, any, they're any second or third, third. and Second or third, yeah. yeah. Right. But get this, Mark. You know, our tribe has a, a uh, we have a tradition of oral history, and those individuals have got that history, and they've wow. got the personal story. And uh, I'm just, I'm just so pleased to see that they've done that. They've yeah, carried out the history of the oral accounts. Yeah. I was I actually like impressed that. with a couple of them. They were really prepared with uh, some research they did. They had books with maps in it and what it looked like back then. And so they've been doing their homework as to you know, discover what was maybe missing from their oral history, a little newer technology of maps and you know, one of the accounts. things One of the things that I note from our tradition is that there's... Um, Sector of humility and modesty among our tribal people. And those people up there, uh, those descendants, are being modest. Yeah. You know, they should get up to, to the bullhorn. <laughs> they ought to just declare, yeah. Yeah. you know, how, what happened to our tribe and all of our descendants. And yet, uh, they're being modest. You know, they at a, at planning meeting, they divulge this, they divulge that, they tell these personal stories that have been carried for dozens and dozens and dozens of years. And you know, Phyllis DeGro, their grandmother, mm -hmm. they were just a remarkable historian. Yeah. You know, oftentimes people say, Rick, you're the historian of the time. No, I'm, all I've done, Mark, is something and I say from the 1950s, because we really had an oral tradition. You know, the elders of our tribe, our ancestors, they're the ones that were the historians. And they really right. carried yeah. on the stories from way back. And some of us people back in the 50s and 60s and 70s were lucky to yeah. you know, be in their presence and hear all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mentioned to the group that... <clears throat> Ward Winton Sr., who was the attorney who stepped forward and volunteered his services to help the tribe when they had no one. They didn't have any legal representation. Yeah, right. Here, Ward Winton Sr., who was born back around 1880, he stepped forward because why? Because he was a, uh, he was a descendant of the tribe. He had in his ancestry, he had full blood native people who were great, mm. great grandparents. Wow. And uh, so he stepped forward back in <clears throat> 1918 and 1919, and he represented Elk Hill and fought, you know, all of his heart. And I was lucky enough to uh, sit and listen to him back in the mid and late 50s. Why? Because he was a friend of my mother. And uh, apparently he had been a friend of my grandparents. Too. Oh, okay. and so my mother carried on. And Ward would come over to our cabin, really, and uh, he would have dinner with us. And he was just a marvelous. I'll I'll say more about 
Ward, when we get to these things, his grandson, Ward Winton III, who has been an attorney at Hayward, uh, is going well, to join us on that July 21st and uh, share with us some accounts of his grandfather, who, hmm. you know, who did a wonderful thing for his family. Right. And that the better way was to speak out. And uh, he defended us hot hard. Recently, Ward the Third turned over uh, his grandfather's legal document back to the LCO. So I'm just real happy that Ward the Third is going to help us out on the July 21st event. And I also I can't mention July 24th, 21st without mentioning also the August 12th. Yeah. That's that's the spiritual event that's going to be held out at Cook Island. And there are going to be a flotilla of pontoon boats bringing people out. Now, the planners, the descendant planners, want to make sure that the descendants have a first opportunity on August 12th to go out there and, uh, and uh, take part in this spiritual ceremony and be held out to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are some of the things, Mark, I have much more to say. <laughs> I want well, to say a little we bit. We have a little bit more of time, and I, I just want to remind people that uh, we're talking with, uh, as I call him, our LCO historian, Rick Germain, about the uh, 100th um, anniversary, if you will, or commemoration of the flooding of Post. Um, we did a, a live event back on March 15th at the casino where uh, there was shared a lot of different pictures from what happened during that time. And we heard from some of the um, descendants of those people that went through that. What was that like? What was that experience for you uh, on March 15th? That was so heartening for me, Mark, because the descendants stood up and uh, told some accounts. They gave some of those uh, those memorable accounts that were passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. Now, um, you know, they have uh, those descendants had grandparents and great grandparents who were still alive, mm-hmm. fortunately for them, and they were able to hear these personal stories. And, and you know, one of the things we should do at these two events at the July twenty first. In the, in the August 12th event, we need to talk about those elders. I, you know, some of my sources were Henry Smith, for example, not only Ward Winton Sr., who was our attorney back in 1918, but Ward Wint, um, Henry Smith, who was a uh, tribal chairman back in the 50s mm. and also even in the 60s. And uh, Henry was just a lovable. Uh, giant of, the, of both the old village and the new village. So, and um, he was a very quiet gentleman, but wow, was he filled with history. Mm. Um, and, um, and his descendants, of course, today have done so much for our tribe. I just can't tell you, when we first started the school in New Post back in 1935, his sons and his uh, wife and kids uh, stepped in and donated their time and wow. volunteered and just gave us this rich history, and that came right from Henry. Uh, two of the people that were just uh, incredible sources of wealth of information mm-hmm. were Edwin and Connie Painter. They were brothers, and um, they were the great uncles of Tom Painter. And, and others, I should I should mention I, you know, these individuals have a long list of descendants themselves. They yeah. have great grandkids and the number in, in the dozens. Uh, Annie Thomas was was an incredible source uh, back yeah. in the seventies when she was doing some of this history. I I just can't say enough about Bill Baker Benashi. Um, who lived over there in Six Mile. And um, he used to, he and I were real close, and 
we drove all over the place, even into Canada. But Bill was a wealth of information and blessed his heart. And uh, we used to drive around and we'd drive around the floors and he would just whip out names. I mean, the guy, could, he remembered the Ojibwe names and he was just yeah. rattling them off and describing their home and uh. telling about their kids and just uh, telling really the heartbeat of our reservation. Sam Frog, who mm. uh, was raised in Old Polk and his father, John uh, his mother, Elizabeth, uh, they have oh, maybe a couple hundred descendants today. Wow. And, uh, you know, they they had a, a home and and Sam grew up in that in that village. And and his mm-hmm. sister, Mamie, I, I just I can't tell you enough about the wealth of stories and, you know, just yeah. painting a picture filled with the vibrancy of life. Phyllis Dubrow, I, you know, she was the historian. Of that really, mm. she collected photos. She had accounts of families and homes. And uh, my dear friend and faith mother, E. Stewart, who had, who adopted me as her son, she told me about the ceremony. She described the ceremonies in the detail. Wow. He described Ogishna, who was probably the second most powerful medicine man who she was selected to help. Mm. And he was driven out of the Chief Lake. He had to go up into Alpha. I, I just, mm. um, Connie and Marie, they were the Riverside folks. They had that whole history on the east side of the road where we had, oh, can't tell you there was George James, John James, Dog Piaf, Viganege, Natamigigi, Gokwe, Minogigi. I could go on and just name literally dozens of people who only had tribal names. And, you know, I remember Connie and Marie telling me about their lives. Wow. And they lived over there and they had little allotment and they were driven out. You know, we just don't we just don't pause and say, what did it feel like, you know, to be removed from yeah. the only place you and your parents and grandparents once lived and driven from your home. And I wanted to comment that I, I learned at the um, at the earlier event on uh, March fifteenth that uh, the flooding, people think of a flooding that, that happens, you know, really quickly after a big rainfall, and all of a sudden we get flooded areas, and it's a sudden event. This event, when, it, when the dam's gates were closed, this event took many months to happen, and many people stayed on their lands. They were not they were going few. to leave yeah. at all whatsoever. And some of the other family members or Native community had to go back with wagons and horses and pick these people up and tie them down and to bring them out of there because, you know, three days later, all of a sudden they were realizing, hey, there's water surrounding my little farm that I have here. And they were stuck. And I remember one of the stories talking about the the fear of the horses. They knew what was going on and the, the screaming that the horses made when they had to bring these people out across fl- flooded roads and they were scared to death. And it was just an amazing thing that happened over months of time. This just didn't happen over a couple of days and all of a sudden it was flooded. You know, the gates were closed uh, on March 15th of uh 1923. Yeah. And uh, that's why we held this commemoration event at the casino on March 15th, yeah. uh, earlier this year. And we just wanted to recognize that March 15th was when they closed yeah. the gates and mm-hmm. the waters began backing up and forming this uh, one of the largest reservoirs in the state of Wisconsin. Yeah. You know, the 
pristine Chippewa flowage. You know, today in our modern world, in the 21st century, we look at the Chippewa flowage as an economic uh, source of livelihood, right. a natural resource that is uh, rich and filled with fish and attracts tourists and so on. I talked to tourists up at the landing last summer, and when I told them this story, I think I almost made them cry. And and I and I worried about that, Mark, because you know we depend on these tourists too. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and I hear I made them feel bad, and so I had to switch. You know, I had this quick say, <laughs> yeah. "Oh, wait a minute, no, we don't." We, yeah. Right. I I saw the look on their faces as I was telling the story, uh-huh. and. I said, we want you back, you know, because now we have this rich, wonderful lake and you folks know how valuable it is as a fishery Mm -hmm. and a boating opportunity. But But we still can't forget why it happened and how it happened. And, and from that point, but it's, yeah, it's just, um, yeah, I, I look at the community now and it's, you know, kind of thriving because of the reservoir that was created. In fact, many people fish these waters. Um, in their traditional ways. They're out uh, spear fishing early in the season, and a lot of them are out on the, the flowage and other lakes that are surrounded by this area. And uh, so this is their livelihood as well. So, Mark, if we're on video, this is what the flowage used to look like. It, it was just a series of yeah. uh, tributaries of streams and rivers, and it was just winding around this yeah. hilly area. And those waterways were filled with wild rice. There were thousands oh. and thousand acres, uh, excuse me, thousand thousand acres of um, pounds of finished wild rice that the tribe depended upon mm. in those riverways. And when the water was rising in the summer of uh, 1923, those rice beds were destroyed. Oh. And you know, our purpose for being here was gone right before our eyes. We sure. lost, you know, a, a major source of our economy. And, and all the livelihood. deer hunting lands that were there. Yes. In the hills. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we had uh, wild cranberries. We had blueberry bogs. We had just, uh, you know, major sources of, of foodstuffs for our right. people. Yeah. And it was gone, you know, practically in an instant. It did take all summer to fill. And you were telling that story uh, that um, uh, Connie and Edwin Tainer told me about their grandmother, Poshkin. Okay. And and I just, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to say much about it, but there were tears in their eyes when yeah. they were telling that story. And I, I mean, yeah. I was sitting there choking up myself. Powerful story. When they told that story of how they had to forcefully remove their grandmother yeah. and she wanted to die. You know, she just, she refused to leave her little cabin and, and the water was coming up to the doorstep and, and she just wanted to stay in there and die. And, mm-hmm. You know, she had been removed uh, several places and her life was tragic. And somebody ought to write a book about her. She was the yeah. daughter of Nanangabi, our greatest chief. Mm. And, um, and so Paskin was, was this incredible woman and she she somebody ought to write a book about her sisters too they were also incredible but her story of being actually bound up and and forcefully removed uh to save her life it, there are other stories like that yeah. there were p- elderly people who just refused to leave and the water was coming up to their ankles and i i just you know, think sometimes that in our modern life, we, we just gloss over these things. And I'm so proud of the people back in 1970 and 1971, we had a committee back there that fought against the relicensing of the, of the Chippewa flowage and the winter dam. And, um, we had a pretty thriving committee. And again, I want to give credit to Mike Tribble and Eddie Benton and uh, just a host of others, uh, Jim White and his wife, uh, Mary, and um, also uh, Marilyn Tribble. I, I could just go on and name a host of John Chambers. It, there was just a bunch of us who yeah. fought against uh, the relicensing. And um, 
and that's when we resorted to occupying the dam and and um you know there was some harrowing evenings there uh, there was a handful of us who were camping sure. out on the dam yeah and there was gunshots going on over our head uh, there were low flying uh, piper cubs flying over us during the daytime mm. and we were listening to um these battery powered radios to find out what was happening and the local radio stations were warning people below the dam that uh that those helpless people who, of us who were occupying dam had yeah. already wired the dam with explosives and we were getting ready to blow it up oh my and and we just sat out there and laughed you know <laughs> and when we heard that on the radio yeah and, and uh, i thought Gee, I don't know the first thing about that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I wonder I wonder how we did that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nonetheless, um there was lots of people joined in in that protest and and um we look back on that time and all of us now are gray-haired and that was 50 some years ago and yeah. we were fighting for those people who were driven out back in uh, 1923. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, um, I just want to remind the people that there's a big event occurring on July 21st. It's going to be a, a sacred commemoration. It's going to be held in a huge circus tent next to the stone building the old historic stone building oh okay uh up in new post and that'll be like five days after the honor of the earth we're going to have food up there um, we'll have some transportation we, we've got planners that are working on that yeah, right now right and also the spiritual e event that's going to be held on august 12th and this is the one where we're going to have a I, I call it a flotilla of pontoon boats mm -hmm. to um, ferry people over to Church Island, which is sacred. And they're going to have a sacred ceremony out there to remember uh, the hundreds of people that were driven out of their homes by uh, the Wisconsin-Minnesota Light and Power Company, which eventually evolved into NSP and is now known as Excel. Yeah. And uh, that big corporate giant, again, they lobbied and won the federal legislation that drove us out of there, stole our land and desecrated our reservation and, um, and just did an injustice. And I, I sometimes wonder, when do we look back historically and, and just recognize the wrongs that have been done to our reservation? Yeah. You know, our people were removed. We were driven out of Wisconsin back in 1852. Mm. And, uh, and again, here in 19, 1923, again, we're driven out of our lands. It's just, there's no stop, you know, no. Uh, no stop to the injustice, it seems like at times. But we're going to do something about it this summer. We're not going to let this thing go away. We're going to talk about our history. And again, I just want to say so much for the descendants in New Post, Tom Tainter, Mark Thayer, uh, Doreen Debro, Tim Debro, Dino Shogi, Deb Valentine. Um, looking at my notes here, Dini uh, Schmack, Elaine Debro, and mm. Father Karun, Sister Felissa, Faith Smith, Sylvia Bracklin. Carol Faff, and there's more. You know, yeah. I wish I had all the names, but uh, these folks are working hard, and I just am so pleased to see the work that they're putting in. You can't imagine the details that go into putting an event like yeah, this. Right. Uh, yeah. I should say too that uh, Saint Saint Ignatius Church in New Post is planning an event on June 25th. And Father Karun and Sister Felicia are the people that are really organizing that event up there. And it's to recognize the loss of their St. Anthony Church out in the Old Post Village. Yeah. You know, we forget about the things. We also should mention that um, 
several uh, medicine lodge uh, societies were destroyed when the flowage was uh, mm. flooded. And we had a medicine lodge society, a thriving medicine lodge society. There, I should mention there were hundreds of graves that were inundated by this yeah. huge reservoir and just desecrated. Uh, the power company made an attempt to remove some of the graves. Some of the graves were removed. But, you know, looking back on my years, I, I was on the tribal council and tribal chairman back in the 70s and 80s, and our conservation wardens used to be alerted that bones were washing up along the shore out there near Church Island, mm. Moonshine Bay. And, and, you know, Mark, it's just detestable to think that, you know, our graves, that our ancestors, that could have been somebody's mother and that could have been, you yeah. know, a, a brother or sister of people. Yeah. And when these things happened, I just can't tell you how people the pain in their hearts, you know, when the bones were washing up along the shores out there. And mm. then we had to reinter those bones, uh, yeah. like mustache, uh, our venerable spiritual leader, uh, would reinter those remains. Okay. There's so much more to say, Mark. I yeah. know we're getting close to the time, but, oh, I mean, we're um, going. Um, I wanted to note, uh, again, people to uh, mark on their calendars this August 12th event because um, it's, uh, it's going to be significant. And I would, um, preliminarily, they have scheduled some events to happen at a certain time, but the main gathering in New Post at the community hall is going from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And it's kind of just an open house sort of thing where uh, people will have uh, speakers and photos, information displays, and uh, other things available there. So um, there's going to be, you know, a pretty significant uh, gathering and display. And then there's a traditional dinner that happens at 5 o'clock or so. These are all kind of preliminary time schedules, but the 12th is the big event, and I would venture to say that uh, Native and non-Native uh, community members would gain a lot by uh, just appearing and, and seeing what was happening there. Again, not to uh, prevent them from using the resources today that are there, but just to be aware what's below the waterline. And um, there's a rich, rich history. In fact, I've heard even that there's um, a, uh, a chimney, I think, from the school that's still visible when the water's low enough. You can see these structures so people don't realize what's, what's there. And I almost sometimes wonder, what would we find if we drained it just for a day or whatever it takes, you know? What would you find below the water? Yeah, you would find uh, some of the remains of the, some of the houses mm -hmm. you'd certainly would find uh, some rocks and things that served as foundations. Yeah. And uh, you would find Other tools, items like wagons. Uh, uh, desks have been found out there from the school. Yeah. Uh, items uh, in the trading post. I mean, it. Uh, Mark there has been very active at low tide in the wintertime when the water does go down. Yeah. And um, I've heard so many stories of people that have gone out there and looked over the site of the old village, you know, people don't realize how low the water gets in the wintertime. It, it just practically drains. There are some small ponds. Mm. In 1970 and 71, one of the reasons we were fighting against relicensing re the flowage was the damage that was being done to the fishery every time those waters go down. Oh. Yeah. They go down way low and, and form small ponds. And uh, nobody really thinks about what is being done, the, the effects of erosion on our, on our islands. We own islands out there. Yeah. And um, we have property, about 4,500 acres that we gained from NSP in a settlement that was mm -hmm. done in uh, 1984. I... Um, I just um, uh, think that, you know, there's so much history to know about, and that's what we're going to do. That's what it's about. Yep. Yes. 
we're going to provide that history and it's going to be an educational event on July 21st. Yeah. And that's on a Friday, Mark. And we're hoping the tribe gives that day off so that they can join us up there near mm -hmm. the stone building in New Post yeah. on the 21st of July. And we mentioned that the um, Honor the Earth tribe, uh, the powwow and homecoming and celebration uh, we'll be dedicating some time to that. I, I'm on the powwow committee because um, I work with the audio video stuff. And I know that um, Willard mentioned that they want to have it. One, they're dedicating this year's powwow in in uh, remembrance of post. And uh, that's one of the themes that's coming out for the powwow itself yeah. is to remember post. And uh, there's going to be um, some time set aside for someone to talk about this history and educate the younger people that are there that have no idea, you know, what might be out there except from what they hear from their grandparents or parents. There's uh, generations that um, both native and more particularly non-native uh, generations of people who've never heard about this history and because it's not in the history books, at least in the, you know, non-native history books. It's, Kind of like you said, glossed over and people think, oh, well, we'll just, it's under the water. We'll just forget about it. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, well, well, we're amazing. tribal people and those are things we don't forget about. You know, we have, we really have a rich heritage. And one of the things we do is we look back and remember, you know, the generations of time that people have harbored these stories and, and just prayed that they be carried on. We have our own school. We have our own mm -hmm. university. We we have so many young people that need to hear these stories. So we, yeah. I, my hope is that um, that we take the time and uh, learn much more about our own personal history here as a tribe. Yeah. <clears throat> Very good. Well, it is. Uh, we still have a few minutes things here and we'll uh, discuss more and more. This will come up more often here on WOJB and through other uh, streaming activities. So Rick, thank you for joining us tonight, today, not tonight, today, here on WOJB.